I was about 18 when it all happened to me. This is a strange story about, well, I don't even know how to explain it. All that I know is that this world is much more complex than we think. I lived with my parents, but at the time of the story, they were on a month-long vacation. So, I had the house all to myself. On some days, I would call some friends over. We would play ping pong in the basement or video games in the living room. One night, after having the gang over, I got a phone call. The number was not listed, but I answered it anyway. After I did it, all I could hear was static. I think it's just a prank or something, I told the guys. Put it on the speaker so we can hear, Todd said. This is what I did, but it wasn't anything more than that static noise that was hurting my ears, so I hung up. After a couple of minutes, I received another phone call. I answered, and again it was static, but something could be heard in the background. Something faint. A woman's voice. She was saying something, but I didn't understand. I hung up the phone again. That was the last call I received. That night, at least. The next day went on as usual. My friends were busy, so I stayed alone all day. I didn't feel like going out. When nighttime came, I made myself some dinner. Then, I heard my phone ringing. Again, no listed number. I answered. Again, the static noise was hurting my brain. Then, all of a sudden, the voice of a woman came up. Help! I think he's dead! Help! And then it cut off. I was confused. Everything was so weird, but I thought someone is playing a prank on me. I didn't pay any attention to it. The same thing happened each day after that. I don't want to bore you with meaningless details, but each day as I got that call, I could hear more and more of the things the woman was saying. On the last day, before my parents came home, I got another call. I answered. By this time, I was really invested. I was curious about what the prankster would say next. And the last call was the longest of them all. Help, I think he's dead. Help, the floor has blood all over it. I didn't mean to do it. Why are you not answering me? He is dying. We got in a fight and he slapped me, so I retaliated and slapped him back. That's when he pulled up a knife. He came close to me and started pushing it into my forearm. I flinched and swatted his hand away. He was drunk and had no balance. He slipped on the soap water that was on the floor. I was doing the dishes at the time. He landed on the knife. It went into his stomach. Help me. Answer me. What type of 911 call is this? Help me. <laughs> and the phone call ended. The woman started crying at the end of the call, right before it was cut off. I could hear the pain in her voice, but it couldn't be real. I knew it was just a prank. It was really creepy. But there was one thing I did. I recorded the entire thing. I thought it was too interesting not to. I kept thinking about it, about what the woman was saying. Maybe it was some sort of a scary story that I could find online, but it seemed too specific to be made up. So that's what I did. I opened my laptop and I started adding keywords like woman kills with knife or murder kitchen stomach soap, you know. But there were many articles and news stories about women killing their husbands with a knife. I was really shocked. I was reading on until I stumbled upon one of them. There was this woman right here in my hometown. Actually, she used to live on the same block as me about 20 years ago. My family moved in this neighborhood right after I was born, so 18 years ago. Actually, after further investigation, the woman lived in the house my parents bought. She murdered her husband in cold blood. That's what people said. But she stated that it wasn't her fault, and no one believed her. She had been sentenced to life in prison, right outside of town. I even found out her name, Mary Stavros. There was also a statement, given by her, saying the exact same thing that I heard on the phone. The fact that he was drunk and fell on the knife, but the cops said she was lying to protect herself. She even asked the police to pull up the recording. She called 911 trying to save him, but they said there was no recording from her. They said that she never called 911, but the woman Mary insisted that she did, and that they answered her call, but no one talked. She was the only one speaking. 
That day, I decided to go to prison. I wanted to talk to her. The things I heard on the phone and the statements that I found online were too similar. Maybe I could find out more. Or maybe I could help her. I know that this sounds weird, but I always had an interest in different theories regarding parallel realities and cross-pathing. I had the recording and maybe she could use it. I went there and told them her name. Hello, I'm here to see Mary Stavros. She's... And before I could finish my sentence, I was interrupted by the guard I was talking to. Do you know Mary? He asked. Um, no, not personally. I, I just wanted to talk to her. I told the guard. She died last night. The guard told me while looking through some files he had in his hand. How? What happened? I asked him while crossing my arms. She kept screaming all night, saying that she was innocent. She threatened to kill herself over and over again. We checked on her for a while, but seeing that she was okay, we stopped and ignored her. She said something about a 911 call and that it will prove her innocence. I don't know, maybe she was crazy. Anyway, she's gone. I'm sorry. He responded and left. As I turned around to leave, there was a woman there. Excuse me, did you say you knew Mary Stavros? She asked me while her eyes teared up. I told her all about the recording and everything that happened. Then I played it for her. Yes, that's her voice. The woman said while breaking down in tears. She asked me for it so she could hear her mom's name even though she was dead. She didn't want her to be remembered as a murderer. I don't know how I got that phone call, but all I can say is that I was sorry I didn't get there one day earlier. I've only had one girlfriend in my entire life, and I was as surprised as I could be when it happened. And you may wonder why. Well, I am and have always been a nerd. I've always been a fan of anime, video games, board games, and basically everything that would keep me inside the house and not force me to interact with other people. And when it comes to friends, well, I never had one. Even my parents were worried about me the majority of my childhood. They would look out the window and see all the neighborhood kids playing, running around, and laughing while their little Jeremy was inside, cooped up in his room, watching cartoons, and not getting a bit of sunlight. But they eventually came to terms with my behavior. Anyways, fast forward. I'm now a freelancer. I made one friend in the meantime, although it was from an online game I played. But we really got along, having the same hobbies, and we would talk daily. In my opinion, that is a friend. I work from home, maintaining the same distance from other people as I did when I was a kid. I'm a programmer, duh, and I always design websites, but not as often. But let's go on with the story. At the time, I was a regular on the dark web. I never bought any items or anything from there. I just browsed around to pass the time. And since I was doing nothing wrong, just window shopping, I didn't think that my privacy and my personal data were at risk. I had to go outside and take my clothes to the dry cleaner. I got into my car and started driving. At the red light, as I was looking around the car for my phone, which I would lose on a daily basis, I felt the car moving from side to side. What the hell? I said, before I took my head from under the dashboard. To my surprise, I saw a girl laying on the hood of my car. I immediately put on the emergency brake and got out of the car. Hey, are you okay? I said. Um? Do you need some help? I asked her again, taking a step towards her. I'm fine. Sorry about that. I was looking at my phone and I guess I didn't see your car. As I saw her face, I was mesmerized. She was the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. Bright blue eyes, freckles all over her nose and cheeks, and a crooked smile which made my legs melt. Uh, are you sure you're okay? I asked again while I was getting lost in her eyes. Yes, yes, thank you for your concern. She responded while smiling at me and tucking her hair behind her left ear. That was it. That was true love, in my opinion, after all. I forgot all about my social anxiety. I forgot all about the clothes. I asked her if she was free for coffee and she said yes. 
That afternoon, I had the best time of my life. Like me, she was kind of nerdy herself, being a fan of the same anime I would watch. Also, I found out that she loved animals and would frequently volunteer at the local shelter. Oh, and another thing I found out about her. Her parents died when she was little. And by putting the pieces together, I realized that the incident scarred her even to this day. She was very emotional. When the waiter brought her the wrong cup of coffee, she didn't want to change the order. She wanted a cappuccino, and he brought her a tall Americano. As I politely asked him to bring her a cappuccino, she felt so embarrassed. She almost crawled under the table. I don't want him to get in trouble. God, I hope he doesn't get fired over this she said, while putting her face in her palms. Don't worry, I said laughing. It's just a mistake. Nobody's in trouble. I tried to comfort her. She was very emotional, to the point that every little thing would send her spiraling into a small form of depression. As the relationship went on, being about a couple of weeks in, one evening, I asked her something that I never thought I would through text messages. Hey, I really miss you, I said. I miss you too, so much, she replied. This is how the conversation started. Anyway, I won't go into the specifics, but the bottom line was that one day, I asked her for nudes. I thought she had an amazing body, and as her boyfriend, well, I didn't think I did anything wrong. She was reluctant, but eventually, she did send me about four pictures. Fast forward a couple of days, and everything was normal. She slept over the past two nights and we had a romantic dinner. I tried to cook for her, but I ended up burning the chicken, so I just ordered Chinese and we watched our favorite anime. It was so nice. I didn't want it to end. After she left, I went online to play a multiplayer game that I was passionate about. You know that friend that I told you about? He was online too. What's up, Jeremy? He asked. Is everything okay? I barely had time to log in and he already asked this question. I didn't know what was going on. Um, yeah, I guess. Everything's fine. Why? I asked him. I know you don't do it on the dark web anymore, but I do, and I saw some pictures of your girl there. What? What pictures? I asked him, not knowing what he was on about. It turned out that the pictures that she sent me were all over the dark web and gaining a whole lot of traction. I panicked. I hoped that she wouldn't see them. I logged off the game and started to use my programming knowledge to see what was going on. It turned out that my computer was hacked and it was so advanced that none of my software detected it. Oh my God, this is bad, I said to myself. I was terrified. I knew that she was into computers too. And if by any chance she would see the photos, she would blame it on me. The next thing I did was to try and find the hacker. I was kind of a pro myself and managed to track the guy down. After trying something for the entirety of the night, I managed to hack into his computer. But when I tried to delete the photos from his hard drive and from the accounts he had where he posted them online, I was greeted with a message. Really? Do you think I'm this stupid? Don't stress, you can have the photos. I know who you are, Jeremy. When I read my name, I froze, but the message wasn't over. I know you're pretty good with computers, and I will need you one day. Tell you what, I'll take down the photos if you're willing to do a favor for me sometime in the future. Tell me your response in the chat box. I didn't know what he meant, but I was so desperate that I agreed. Fine, just take them down, I wrote. Immediately, the photos were deleted from the dark web. Then, I received the last text from him. Good talk to you in the future. My girlfriend was finally out of harm's way, but I still had a debt to pay to this man. I didn't know what, I didn't know when. All I knew was that he owned me. Even to this day, I haven't received any instructions from him, and I hope I never do. In all my 22 years on Earth, I never thought that the one thing I would ever be afraid of was sleeping. You may wonder what I'm talking about. How can I be afraid of sleeping? Well, let me just tell you exactly what happened so you can get a better idea. This entire period of terror took place about one year ago. There weren't any signs that the first night would be different from the countless others I had. 
I came home after being out with some friends. During that day, nothing out of the ordinary happened. We watched a movie, had some fries, you know, typical things you do on a Saturday. They all wanted to go drinking after 11 p.m., but it wasn't quite my cup of tea. I would much rather stay at home and relax. So I said goodbye to them. All the while, they were screaming at me. Boo, you're such a buzzkill, while laughing. But I was fine with that. I got home, took a shower, and then got ready for bed. Not long after, I fell asleep. What the hell? I said to myself while opening my eyes in the middle of the night. I felt like something was pinning me down to the bed, not letting me move. I could only move my eyes. I tried to get up, but I couldn't. What's going on? I tried to say, but my mouth wouldn't move. I was stuck. The next thing that came across my field of vision scared the living shit out of me. There she was, a woman standing in the doorway, looking at me with deep black eyes with no trace of white. She was smiling, but barely, and her fingers looked like long, sharp claws. The woman had greasy black hair covering a part of her face and flowing down to her elbows. Also, she was wearing a lacy dress which seemed to be stained with blood. Help! Help! My brain was on high alert, but I couldn't move a muscle. My eyes were moving all over the place, looking for something to help me out of this situation. But I couldn't do anything. All I could do was watch that woman who broke into my house and hope that she will spare my life. Eventually, while eyeballing the woman for some time, I fell asleep. In the morning, I woke up and immediately got out of bed, checking to see if I'm alright. Then, my eyes concentrated on my doorway. I slowly walked there to see if there was any trace of what I saw last night. Did I dream everything? But it felt so real! I said to myself while calming down. The day went by as normal, and I forgot about what I thought I dreamt. Fast forward, and I was in bed again, being exhausted from the gym. I fell asleep, and to my surprise, at around 2.30 a.m., I woke up again. I knew what time it was because I could see the clock on the wall, but next to it, in the doorway, was a familiar face. The same woman, smiling at me, was back. I tried to scream and move, but the same thing happened. I was pinned to my bed, but something was… different. She took one step towards me. I was freaking out, but my muscles didn't want to listen to me. They were asleep. I kept my eye on her and eventually fell asleep. The next morning, I was certain that I didn't dream. I was certain that someone broke into my house. So that day, I went out and bought everything necessary to make my house as secure as possible. Locks upon locks. This will keep that weirdo out, I said while installing them. I went to bed confident that nothing like that would happen again. But boy, was I wrong. Stop! Stop! Please! Leave me alone! I thought, while at the exact same hour, 2.30, I woke up to see the woman walking towards my bed. She took a few more steps while I was helpless. She was right next to me, staring into my eyes almost like she was after my soul. I screamed inside as hard as I could while she reached her finger towards my face. It was getting closer and closer until everything went black. I woke up in cold sweats, not knowing what to believe. I went online and typed in exactly what I saw. The woman and the fact that I couldn't move. That's when I found out about sleep paralysis. After learning about the concept, I never saw her again. But each night, before I fall asleep, she's there in the back of my mind, not wanting to leave me alone. I lived in a very quiet and friendly neighborhood while I grew up. It was one of those suburbs you'd see in the movies. White fence, a dog on every lawn, minivans, moms picking up the neighbor's kids to take them to soccer practice. Yeah, it was that kind of place. My mom didn't have a job. She mostly stayed at home and took care of me and my little sister, Anna, who was one year younger than me. As every normal kid, we were enrolled in different activities. I was focused more on sports and Anna liked to read, so she was part of a book club. 
Our living room had a special place for my athletic achievements, you know, trophies, diplomas, and game balls. Anna also had a spot there. She won so many spelling bees that the other kids would be afraid to compete with her. From the outside, we seemed like the perfect family. Mom would make the best food I would ever eat in my life. She would also create these incredible flower arrangements for dinner, even though it wasn't a special occasion. But I didn't tell you anything about my dad. My dad was mysterious, to say the least. We never knew what he did for a living, but I would always see him in a suit. He would go to work early in the morning, even before the sun came up, and he would come home a minute or two before dinner. He always took his phone calls in another room, and we were forbidden to go into his office, which was on the second floor of our house. This story happened around the time when we were supposed to go on vacation. I remember it like it was yesterday. I woke up at around 5 a.m. I was so excited and I couldn't sleep. We had a flight at 9 a.m. which would take us to the Maldives. I tossed and turned the entire night, and when the sun peeked up from the horizon, I got out of bed and went downstairs. I thought the rest of my family was sleeping, but I was wrong. As I came down, I could hear my dad speaking. I quietly went towards the kitchen and heard a small part of the conversation. I told you that I don't have time for this. I hired the guy to take care of it. What's the problem? I have a flight in a couple of hours. Don't make me come down there myself and do his job. You know how that's going to end. I didn't know what he was talking about. All I knew is that he was serious. Yeah, yeah, fine. Make sure the candy's there. All of it. I'll be right over. And he ended the call. Candy? I thought to myself, while licking my lips. My dad went towards the coat hanger and grabbed his jacket. I knew he was going to the car, so I quickly went into the kitchen and entered the garage from there. I heard his footsteps approaching, so I hopped in the back of his car and hid under the seat so that he wouldn't see me. I wanted to surprise him. Dad came and off we went. Destination candy. I was so excited. I didn't want my sister to get more than me, so that's why I went with him. While on the road, I started giggling. He'll never know I'm here, I told myself. But my dad heard the noises I made and stopped the car immediately. What the hell is going on there? He said while looking for something on the seat next to him. At that moment, I didn't know what it was, but now that I'm older, I have a pretty strong feeling that it was a gun. Surprise! I said while I came up from under the seat. I know you're going to get candy, so I wanted to help, I told him. What candy? He asked in a confused manner. Yeah, I heard you on the phone, I told him while smiling. Okay, yeah, candy, right. We're going to my warehouse, but you have to promise me that you'll stay in the car, okay? He told me. I agreed, and we were on our way. Soon after, we got to our destination. In the car, promise me, he said. He got out and went inside. Well, being a kid, I needed something to stimulate me. And I waited, 10, maybe 20 minutes. But he wouldn't come out, and all I could think about was the candy. I decided to go in and make him hurry up. I got out of the car and approached the warehouse. While standing right next to the door, I heard someone shouting. Maybe there isn't enough candy, I thought, so I carefully opened the door and went inside. What I saw next freaked me out. My dad was in the middle of the warehouse on a chair. He was tied up, and around him, two men. One had a gun, and the other had a baseball bat. My dad was pretty shaken up, Actually, his face was rather bloody. The men kept asking him if he still thought he was a big shot. They kept hurting him, and I started crying. They couldn't see me as I was hiding behind a big crate. You know you're gonna die, right? Tell me the codes. Don't be stupid. You don't want your family to die too, right? One of the men told him. Leave my family out of this, he shouted. I'll give you the codes. 
My dad continued. Finally, the man said. My dad proceeded to give them the information they needed. That wasn't so hard, was it? The guy told my dad before pointing his gun at his head. My eyes were so wide. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Seconds later, bang. A piercing sound almost shattered my eardrums. It was so loud that I closed my eyes and put my hands over my ears. A ringing that lasted a couple of seconds stopped me from hearing what they were talking about. I finally opened my eyes just to see an image that will haunt me to my grave. The men were laughing and dad, he was dead. I froze and didn't move until the two men were out of sight. I didn't know what to do. I went over to him and started crying. His eyes were wide open, but he was no longer with me. With hands stained with his blood, I walked home that morning. It was still early and everyone was asleep. I went inside the house with a haunting look on my face. It was like I was a zombie. I didn't feel anything. I didn't know anything. My mom was up and as soon as she saw me, she came over and asked me what happened. Are you okay? Where's your dad? What? And before she could finish her question, the blood on my hands from hugging my dad caught her eye. It was right then and there that she knew. My father was gone. Soon after that happened, we moved far away from that town. We went on the opposite side of the country, trying to get our lives together. But even to this day, I can't shake away the feeling I had when I saw my father murdered right in front of me. I'm hiding while writing this. I can't tell you exactly where I am because I'm not safe. There is someone out there looking for me. I don't know exactly what the bounty hunter wants. I don't know if I'm supposed to be dead or I just need to be delivered just like a piece of meat. Anyway, I want all of you to know my story. I don't know if this is going to help or that I'm going to get out of this alive, but at least it's worth a try. It happened two years ago. I was working at a large company. It was my first job, so I didn't have a high profile position, but I was excited. I was full of hope going into the finance world, but I would find out soon enough that nothing is ever as it seems. I wasn't allowed to be a part of any meetings or any strategic planning. All I was needed for was to make the coffee and other similar things. I just thought this was what working your way up the ladder means. One day, my boss and two other high-ranking people at the company went into his office. They shut off the blinds. I didn't know what went on. But at 1 p.m., I was expected to deliver my boss's afternoon coffee. So even though the door was shut, I knocked one time and went in holding a hot espresso with no sugar. They all looked at me as if I was an intruder. They stopped talking immediately and a strange silence took over the room. What? My boss asked while his eyes turned red. Don't you know this is a private meeting? Who told you to come in here? He asked while banging his fist on his desk. You did, sir. Every day at 1 p.m. You said you need your afternoon pick-me-up. I answered while just standing at the door with the coffee. He sighed and told me to put it on his desk and get out. But while I walked towards them, the other two looked at me and they were whispering something. As I got closer, they stopped and after I put the cup on his desk and headed towards the door, they started whispering yet again. I found it weird, but I couldn't ask what was it about. One evening, I got a very strange request. Matt, come here. I need to talk to you. My boss told me. I don't know what was going on. I thought he would fire me, but I went anyway. Yes? You wanted to see me? I asked. I know how hard you've been working around here. I watched you closely. And even though you were very good at the things you did until now, I know you have a lot of potential. You seem like a very smart guy, and because I have an eye for talent, I want to give you a promotion. How about you take over the Maverick account? He asked me while looking me in the eyes. M maverick That is a high-profile account, sir. It's worth over $10 million. Are you sure? I mean, I just started, and... Before I could speak my mind, he interrupted me. Look, kid, I know you have what it takes. This is an order. 
You'll take over this account, okay? He asked. Got it. I responded, and then I left the office. I was scared, but happy at the same time. I mean, I didn't want to deliver coffee for the rest of my life. This is why I got into the finance game. To make something of myself. This was my big break. Everything went well at the office, but after about a week, at 10 p.m., someone knocked on my door. It was the feds. They accused me of fraud and came to take me away. I didn't even know what was going on. Luckily, I had some money for bail and got released that night. I called my boss and told him all about it, how that account was what got me into trouble. But he threatened me. He said he would kill me with his own hands if I would say anything to the police. And furthermore, he had them in his back pocket. The blame would still fall on me. And don't forget, kid, I know where you live, he told me before ending the call. I was scared out of my mind. I thought I would either get jailed again or worse, killed. And I didn't want any of it. Even though I couldn't leave my house, I decided to run and find some sort of way to prove my innocence. Not long after I had fled, I was everywhere on the local news. The police were looking for me, so I had to get a disguise. I found a small shop that sold costumes. I managed to change my appearance and I felt a little bit more relieved. Well, as relieved as you can feel with the cops on your tail for something you didn't even do. One evening, as I was walking towards a motel, from around the corner appeared one of the most beautiful women I'd ever seen. She also looked like she worked out a lot. We bumped into each other. Oh, sorry about that, I said. She smiled at me. No problem, I'm Cassie. What's your name? She asked me while hypnotizing me with her beautiful green eyes. I I'm Matt Mentis, I said like an idiot. I never should have revealed my real name but at the time, I didn't realize it. She said she thought I was cute, and I instantly blushed. She took my hand and pulled me close to her. We were inches away from touching lips. Now I got you. And I was confused. I didn't know what she meant. Then, before I could say anything, she pulled me even closer. It was pretty hot, I'm not gonna lie. A beautiful girl pulling me this close? It was something I was not used to, but there was something poking me in the stomach. It was a gun. She said she was a bounty hunter sent by my former boss. In a moment of desperation, I headbutted her and ran away. I love the thrill of the chase. I hope I won't have to kill you. You're pretty cute. As I was running as fast as I could, I arrived at the motel and locked the door. I was terrified. How could my life change so much? And especially if I didn't do anything. Gradually, I started feeling very tired. I fell asleep. At around 2 a.m., my eyes opened as I felt something on my chest. I couldn't breathe. Ah! I screamed. At that moment, the cold barrel of the gun went into my mouth. The bounty hunter was laying on top of me in a position that should have aroused me. But taking into consideration the danger of losing my life, I couldn't concentrate on anything but staying alive. Come on, cutie pie. Make me work for it. Don't be so easy to catch. She told me while taking the gun out of my mouth. What do you want from me? I asked her. Well, first of all, I don't want to take you to your boss just yet. I want to have a little fun. She said while putting her hand on my chest and slowly moving it down. I want you to run right now. I won't follow you for five hours. After that, you're fair game. Do the best that you can to avoid me. But as you'll see, you won't be able to do it for long. She told me, before giving me a short peck on the cheek and getting off of me. Go! What are you waiting for? Come on, we can reach an understanding, I said while putting my hands up in the air. Do you think I'm playing? She yelled before shooting her gun, the bullet going inches past my ear. Go! I got scared and ran wherever my feet took me. I was confused, scared, and adrenaline was running through my veins. Now I am in hiding. She hasn't found me yet. I just hope to God I will get out of this thing alive. A loud sound woke me up, and my eyes went straight to the clock on the wall. It was late, 11 o'clock in the night. I heard movement at my front door, and barely a moment later, my door opened. I had fallen asleep in the living room while reading for the test I had in the morning. I laid there, with my eyes open in panic. I couldn't move a muscle. 
I could only move my eyes, so I tried to follow their movements. There were two of them, one blonde haired and the other had dark hair. One of the dark haired guys chuckled, sending a shiver down my spine. You pretty little thing. She can't move? The other one said. I don't care, man. The first guy replied. He ran his hand through my hair, smiling down at me. I wanted to scream out for help, but I was paralyzed. I could only watch in horror as he caressed my face and his partners carted my things away. I just moved in three months ago, so my things were relatively new. I had saved up money in my sophomore year to be able to live on my own, and now I was being robbed. Tears began to fall from the corner of my eyes as the guy pulled down my shorts, revealing my panties. Jake, we can't afford to be distracted, the blonde haired partner said. Jake didn't reply, he only whistled softly as his gaze ran over me. His fingers traced my thighs and inched upward. The blonde haired guy left my apartment, carrying a bag filled with my stuff. I started to feel like a weight was lifted from me. I tried to wiggle my fingers and they obeyed. Jake had no idea I could move. His attention focused on my bare thighs. I knew I didn't have a lot of time before the other guy came back, so I had to act quickly. In one swift motion, my hand whipped back and grabbed the lamp that they had somehow missed and <clears throat> smashed it on Jake's head. He yelled in pain and dove for me, but I anticipated his move and moved faster than he expected. He crashed into the couch with a muffled bang. I raised the lamp again and brought it down on his back with all the fury I felt, screaming like a banshee. His partner rushed in and paused when he saw me. I must look like quite the sight. My hair was flying in different directions. My mouth was open in a silent scream as I hit Jake again with the lamp not caring that I was wearing only a tank top and panties. I was sure my screams would have alerted the neighbors. I only had to stall them till the cops showed up. The blonde haired guy stopped mid-step and stared at me for a few moments, catching up to my plan. Let's go! He yelled. Cover blown! Jake staggered to his feet and they both ran out. I dropped back on my couch, totally exhausted. My heart was still beating very fast. I couldn't imagine what would have happened to me if I hadn't been able to move at that moment. There was no denying it. I had to get help. I wouldn't allow myself to be that vulnerable ever again. I tried to still the slight tremors racking through my body as I held the lamp tightly to my chest. I was still terrified and I laid awake for a long time, jumping at every slight sound before exhaustion lulled me to sleep. My life was a simple one. I was a sophomore studying computer science and I lived alone in an apartment that wasn't far from school. I was a straight A student and the other students looked up to me. My best friend Kate was the only person I hung out with. My life was simple, at least to people who didn't know my secret. I was a hacker, a professional one, and I was making a lot of money duping people on the dark web. Using a complex algorithm, I had managed to set up some sites that asked for personal information. Once a person put in their email, I could hack their device location and tell them exactly where they were. Most people hated the lack of privacy, so I always put up a second option. All they had to do was unsubscribe from the mailer list. Once they clicked on that, they would be notified that their device was being corrupted with a virus and that they had to buy an antivirus. Three out of five people caved in and sent the money making me richer. The money was sent to an online mobile money app that couldn't be traced back to me. I was living a good life and was taking good care of myself. My laptop lit up with a message and I smiled, eager to have more money. I sent in the usual message informing the person of their location. I frowned, the person wasn't living very far from me. I shrugged and sent in the second option. The user accepted to receive the code and I sent it and waited for it to be sent back. After the usual message of the virus, the person went silent. That meant the user didn't fall for it. I was still staring at my laptop when my phone lit up with a message. I hurried to it, thinking it was Kate. It was an unknown number and the message read, Who the hell do you think you are? I sent back a reply asking who it was. I know what you're doing on the dark web. A chill passed through me and my hands started to shake. How was this possible? What do you want? I texted back money. I was being blackmailed and there was nothing I could do about it. I gritted my teeth as I accepted the offer. I sent the money and hoped that that would be the end of it. I decided to quit my dark web scamming and just focus on school. After all, I had more than enough money to survive. Being caught took away the thrill. The next week, I woke up to a message from the person who blackmailed me asking for more money. 
I replied in the negative. Your name is Laura. You're in your second year and you live close to the university. I screamed in anger, wondering how the person knew so much. I didn't even know if it was a guy or a girl. I sent the money reluctantly. I didn't want my secret out in the open. The next day, the same message came in. This time, I flat out ignored it. I was nobody's bank. I refused to reply and hopefully the person would get the hint and leave me alone. A knock on my front door made me jump. I crept slowly and peeked through the peephole. I sighed in relief, it was just Kate. I opened the door for her, glad to see a familiar face. I hugged her and invited her in. She held her phone up and said, you really thought no one would find out? What's that? I came closer to her phone and I saw a message, the same message I had just received a while ago. Kate was the person blackmailing me. Kate, how could you? She rolled her eyes and demanded that I give her a thousand dollars if I wanted her to keep her mouth shut. I shook my head firmly. No way, I was so angry. I thought she was my friend. Even if she had found out about it, she could have just asked me. Get out, I pointed to the door. Not until you give me my money, I'll scream. I laughed, mirthless, and told her to get out. She opened her mouth and started to scream. I jumped on her, covering her mouth. We both fell down. I was on top of her, my hands still over her mouth. Her blue eyes were wide as she buckled underneath me. I pressed down on her even harder. Her hand came up, slapping me in the face, hitting my chest, but I refused to move. I had some extra pounds on her and I was using it to my advantage. Her hands reached up and grabbed my neck. She squeezed, cutting off my air. I had to release her mouth to tug her hands off me. I gasped when I managed to pry her hands off. Kate pushed me up and rolled over till she was on top of me. I was still trying to get enough air in. She punched me and my eyes watered. I struggled under her, but she wouldn't budge. She punched me again and I got enraged. I pushed her with my hands and she tumbled back. I ran to my kitchen and I pulled out a knife. I turned back to her, motioning to the door with a knife. We were both panting heavily and I told her to leave my house and she looked at me with hatred in her eyes. Kate didn't move from her spot and I started to wonder why she was so particular about getting the money. I walked slowly to get with the knife outstretched and I told her to leave if she didn't want to get hurt. When she realized that my threat was real, she made her way to the front door and let herself out without glancing back. I let the knife clatter to the floor and held my head in my hands. I was about to stab my best friend. What kind of person was I? For the next few days, I didn't leave my apartment. I spent my time staring at nothing. My confrontation with Kate kept flashing through my mind. My phone rang and I picked it up without looking at who was calling. I sat up suddenly. No, she can't be dead, no. I dressed up hurriedly and I rushed out. I felt really numb as I hailed a cab to Kate's dorm. A crowd was gathered in front and my heart sank. Just as I got to them, I saw a stretcher being wheeled through the crowd. Kate was on it and her wrist had been slashed. I fell to the ground, my legs had turned to jelly. Kate killed herself. I later got to find out that she had a brain tumor and was supposed to go to surgery but couldn't because she didn't have enough money. I blamed her death on myself and it was a scar I knew that I would carry for a long time. There's a job this weekend, are you interested? Becky asked me. She walked to where I sat on the sofa and plopped down. We both shared an apartment and had been living together for about seven months. Becky and I were out of college and were currently unemployed. After looking for jobs for a while, we had given up and gotten a small place together. We got money from doing odd jobs, reselling things for people or loading warehouses. Most times, the jobs could be stressful, but Becky and I let go of our dignity in exchange for the money we would get. Dignity could never feed us anyway. Where is the place? I asked. Becky told me that it was a bit far, almost at the outskirts of town, but because of that, they were willing to pay us $200 each. My eyes bulged at the sound of the money and I immediately told her we had to go. The next day, a cab dropped us off at the warehouse location and Becky called the owner. He directed us to enter through the back. I thought it was a bit strange, almost as if he had something to hide. We got into the warehouse and found about three other guys there. One of the guys was the owner, the rest were like us. 
we were asked to sit down and wait for the goods we had to upload. I sat close to Becky and we spoke in low tones, planning how we would spend the money. We heard a truck pull up and we all sat up. The back door opened and a huge guy walked in. He told us that our only job was to carry the boxes and arrange them inside. We were not supposed to look inside or ask questions. The boxes weren't really heavy, but there had to be close to 400 boxes in the truck. We kept on working, passing the boxes between us to the last person who arranged them on the floor. We were down to the last set, and by that time, we were all exhausted. Sweat droplets ran down our faces, but we didn't complain. I looked at Becky, where she was standing close to the truck. She looked really tired. We're almost done. I tried to encourage her, even though I was tired too. She nodded and passed me the box. It slipped from her fingers just before I could collect it. The men around us froze as the contents of the box spilled out. White powder spilled all over the floor and I stared at Becky aghast. They had us moving drugs. They were making us commit a crime. What's that? Looks like cocaine. Someone behind me said. I swallowed hard as one of the guys supervising us came close. What's going on over there? He asked. He was big and walked over with a swagger. I scanned him quickly and saw that he wasn't armed. Becky's frightened eyes met with mine and I swallowed hard. Perhaps they wouldn't notice anything was amiss. No, nothing, I stammered. He got close enough to see what had happened and at that point I knew it was over for us. There was no way they would let us go. Run! I yelled at Becky. We tore around the truck and ran as if our lives depended on it, which it did. The rest of the guys loading the warehouse ran away too after seeing that they had been helping them load cartons of illegal drugs. No one wanted to get into trouble for a few hundred dollars. The money was too small compared to the risk. I heard the last girl scream, but I didn't bother to look back. And of course, she wasn't my business. One of the guys was chasing us really hard. I glanced back at Becky. She was huffing and doing her best to keep up. Zoe, I don't, she gasped, know how much I can keep up. Keep running, I yelled back. Becky was a bit plump and I could see the exertion running had caused on her. Her face was pink and sweaty. Her chest was heaving as she struggled to breathe. I couldn't leave Becky behind, so I urged her on and told her to run faster. I didn't want to think about what would happen to us if we got caught. Lucky for us, only one guy was chasing us while the other one tried to capture the rest. I saw the road just ahead of us and heaved a sigh of relief. I turned back to tell Becky the news when I saw that the guy was almost upon her. Look out! My warning came a moment too late. Becky was pushed to the ground by the man and she yelled as he dragged her by the leg. I turned back immediately and ran for them. Becky was screaming as she tried to free her leg from his hand. He kept dragging her back through the dust. I ran straight for the man and he quickly dropped Becky's leg when he saw that I wasn't stopping. I shouted at Becky to run and she did, limping to the main road. The man sneered at me and slapped me hard across my face. My ears rang and my vision swam. I brought my knee up and kicked the man between his legs. I heard a satisfying grunt. I crawled away and half hopped, half jogged till I was free from his groping hands. I cradled the side of my face that he had slapped. It was tender and felt sore. I couldn't worry about that now. I ran as fast as I could even though I was getting really tired. I saw Becky reach the main road and was relieved that at least she was safe. I looked back and saw that the man had given up on chasing me. I was almost at the main road where speeding cars could see us. I got to Becky's side and doubled over, breathing hard. Together, we walked and limped till we were able to get a cab that took us back home. We didn't tell anyone about what happened and could only hope that those people would not be able to trace us. Becky said the guy that linked her up with the warehouse job had disappeared. She didn't know him very well and had only met him a few times at the bus stop. Becky and I started to apply for jobs rather than looking for menial jobs. Soon enough, we got jobs at different places. 
The pay wasn't fantastic, but it was way better than not knowing when the next money would come. Nine one one, please state your emergency. I was breathing hard as I struggled to speak. My parents were at it again, and this time I was sure someone would get really hurt. I could still hear my mom screaming from time to time. The day started pleasant enough. If pleasant meant hiding in my closet because my dad came home drunk early this morning, my mom had gone out to open the door for him and was rewarded with a smack to her face. I had been standing at the foot of the stairs, watching with my heart pounding. It had always been like this for as far back as I could remember. It was until I went to a friend's house for a sleepover that I saw that it wasn't a normal thing for fathers to hit their daughters. I was seven then. I was the only child and my only consolation was that I just turned 18 and once I had the resources, I could stay on my own. I thought my mom was weak, always trembling before my dad and bowing to his every desire. It was a shame I looked a lot like my dad. Sometimes I hated staring at my brown eyes because they reminded me so much of him. Even my dirty blonde hair irritated me whenever I looked at it. Once, he had hit my mom and she fell to the ground. His eyes had snapped to my frightened ones. Alice, come here. He had beer stains on his shirt and his trousers were hanging low on his hips. I turned and ran up the stairs. I still had scars on my body from moments when I was too slow to run away or times when I didn't see it coming. No one questioned why I wore long sleeve clothes, even in the middle of summer. They probably thought it was my weird idea of fashion. He had hit me more times than I could remember. Not this time. I had been saving up money, and I already had enough to survive on my own for a while. I could get a job or do something that would sustain me. I heard his stumbling steps behind me, and it propelled me to run faster. Dave, wait! My mom was crying. I glanced back to see that she was holding onto his leg. She always tried to stop him and take the brunt of his abuse. It was never enough. I once asked her why she didn't leave him. With tears in her eyes, she told me she had no place to stay. She was the only child and her parents were dead. We were the only family she had. I saw my dad kick her away in his pursuit of me. I didn't look back again. I ran to my room, locked it, and hid myself in the closet. My mom's screams reached me where I hid, and it was all I could do not to rush back out and try to do something. With trembling hands, I picked up my phone and dialed the emergency number. 911, please state your emergency. The person repeated. I... I choked. Please, I sobbed. I couldn't see past my tears. I was claustrophobic and could feel a panic attack coming as I felt the closet walls closing up on me. Speak clearly. State your emergency. He's going to kill us, I said with utmost conviction. My mom screamed again and I whispered into the phone, Please, hurry up. I hung up and got out of my closet. My knees buckled and I reached out a hand to steady myself. I took a few steadying breaths and marched downstairs. They were in the living room. My mom had blood running down her face and her blonde hair was matted in it. My dad was standing over her, swaying on his feet and slurring nonsensical words. My eyes met with my mom's and she shook her head mouthing that I should run. S stop I stuttered, fear evident in my voice. Or what? He asked, laughing and hiccuping. I called 911. They're on their way here. His brown eyes darkened with rage, and Mom let out a whimper as he approached me. I stood my ground, and in retrospection, I probably should have run away again. You did what? I could smell the stale beer on his breath. I held my chin high even as my voice wobbled. I repeated what I said and moved back a step. My common sense told me to escape, but I couldn't leave my mom with this monster. I had missed what he was clutching in his hand. It was most likely what he had used to make my mom bleed. His hand came up faster than I expected, and I stepped back immediately, but it was too slow. Something scratched the side of my face and I screamed as I felt blood run down my face. He was holding some sort of belt with spikes on it. He grabbed my hair and pulled me to where my mom still stayed. He threw me and I collided with her. He was saying that he would teach me a lesson that I would never forget. I watched as he straightened the belt. There were a lot of spikes in it. He stood over us and swayed back. He was so drunk that I believed it would make it easy for us to run away. 
the cops were taking a long time to get here. Mom, we have to run. I shoved her and urged her to stand up. She grunted and rose gently, holding onto her side. The belt whipped back and I shoved my mom out of the way. It landed on my shoulder and I yelled in pain. I screamed at my mom to run as I tried to dodge him. His eyes were alit with fury that we could consider running away from him. He brought down the belt again, but I rolled out of the way. He tripped and crashed to the ground. My mom was already at the door and I was right behind her. As we got out, I heard the sirens approaching us. The police car stopped in front of us and the cops got down. They took in our bloody appearances and called the ambulance. My mom was treated for bruised ribs and got some stitches. I was also treated and given some ice for the swelling on my face. My dad couldn't even struggle as they carted him away. The testimony against him was strong enough to lock him up for a long time. I hoped I never had to see him again. My mom joined a community that helped people who had gone through abuse and she got better over time. With the money I had, I supported her till I got my first job waitressing. I had never looked forward to my future, but now that I was free from my dad, it seemed like I could do something good with my life. All because I had the courage to make that call. Get the job done as soon as possible. I sighed as the call ended. Just when I decided to take a few days off for myself, another job had to delay me. I was a bounty hunter and was pretty good at my job. We didn't ask questions. Once a bounty is placed on a person, my job was to find the person. Easy. I worked with an underground chain of spies and agents. Things we did were always kept secret. No one above ground knew about the bounty hunts. I fired up my laptop and checked the details. The man's name was Chris, and he was in his 30s. He lived in one of those big estates in LA. I memorized his house number and took note of the number of guards that he had. His personal guards were four, and none of them followed him to his house. Besides one other guard at the gate, there was no other person staying with him at night. I planned to go in the evening. The faster I got the job done, the faster I could be on my break and try to enjoy myself for a while. I was 25 and lived a comfortable life. I got paid handsomely every time I captured someone with a bounty. Most of these people were criminals that had been eluding the police or FBI, so they placed bounties on them in hopes that one of us would capture them. I finalized my plans and took my bike to my target's house. I was dressed in black from head to toe. I stalked up to the house quietly. I crawled up the fence and landed on the balls of my feet. I saw the security guard dozing off on a chair in front of the gate. He had made it easy for me. I walked to him silently and shot a dart into his arm. His body went limp in a matter of seconds. The place looked like a graveyard. It was very dark and quiet. I approached the front door as silently as possible. My plan was to knock him out, then call my boss to pick him up. I didn't want it to get messy. I had a stun gun and I would use it on him if the need arises. My eyes roamed over the surroundings and I thought it was strange that he managed to avoid getting captured by the police. I wondered how, especially if he lived in such a big place. I felt a presence behind me and reacted fast. I drew up my stun gun and swiveled around quickly. I shot it at the man who managed to almost creep up on me, but he dodged it. He barreled into me and knocked the gun from my hand. We fell to the floor, rolling on top of each other. I brought up my elbow and jammed him in the nose. He flinched but didn't retreat as he successfully pinned me down. He was heaving as I struggled underneath him. This was really bad. I had let myself get captured. My boss had given me the wrong intel and now I was paying for it. He dragged me up and led me into the house without saying a word. This must be one of Chris's guards that I was told never followed him home. The door opened and I was tossed inside like a rag doll. Chris was standing there, watching me with an amused smile on his face. He ordered the guard to tie my hands and I couldn't resist because Chris had a gun pointed at me. You have some nerve coming here. He ran his hand through my long hair, smiling softly to himself. Leave us. He ordered his guards who promptly obeyed. I was terrified but refused to show it. I flexed my fingers behind me, testing to see if I could free myself. If it was just the two of us left, perhaps I could escape somehow. I was sure of it. Someone had sent me here knowing I would get captured. 
I had been betrayed. Chris pulled down the zipper of my black hoodie, revealing the tank top I wore underneath. My breaths came out faster as I wondered what he wanted to do with me. I subtly tried to free my hands just in case I got an opening to run away. Who sent you? He said. I clenched my teeth and stared at him adamantly. Even though I had gotten betrayed, it was against our ethics to reveal any information. Chris laughed when I didn't respond, shaking his head. He trailed a finger down the side of my face, over my neck, and down the middle of my chest. Why was he touching me like that? He muttered to himself that he needed to punish me. I braced myself for whatever torture he had planned for me, so I was shocked when he grabbed my face and kissed me. My eyes were open in surprise as Chris kissed me with his eyes closed. He groaned and pressed harder into me. This man was a psychopath. Tears ran down my face as I started to think of what he could do to me. I felt so violated. His hand came up and grabbed my neck, choking me. Kiss me back. I refused, my mouth still against his. When the pressure exerted in, my neck became more than I could bear. I opened my mouth and kissed him back, disgust welling inside me. He lessened his grip and continued to kiss me, pulling my hair and rubbing my neck. My hands came free of the ropes that I had been struggling with and I rejoiced quietly. I had a chance to escape this place. Chris withdrew and stared at me. He asked who sent me and got angry when I didn't respond. He slapped my face hard and kissed me again. That was how he questioned me and every time I refused, he would slap or punch me before kissing me. When he finally moved away from me, my face was pulsing and my body hurt in several places. His back was to me, so I acted fast. I removed the other stun gun I had in the waistband of my jeans and stilled when he turned to face me again. I stood up calmly and brought up my hand. I gave him no chance to react before stunning him. He fell to the ground, his body twitching slightly. I heard the guard's footsteps from somewhere in the house, and I didn't wait for him to catch up with me. I ran out and climbed up the fence, my muscles groaning in protest. It hurt to move, but I managed to do it. I didn't look back as I got down and hopped on my bike and sped off. I resigned from my job the next day, giving my boss no explanation. If someone in the agency wanted me out of the way, I would gladly step aside. I had enough money to live by myself anyways. I never spoke of what happened to anyone and I pretended it didn't happen. I still see Chris's face in my nightmares and I can't control it. I woke up suddenly in the middle of the night, my eyes flying open. I felt a presence next to me and tried to turn towards it, but I couldn't move and my breaths came out faster. Run, save your mom or I will gut her and sell her organs on the dark web. A deep, spooky voice said. My body was shaking. I wanted to ask who was there, but I couldn't speak. I didn't know which one terrified me more. The fact I was unable to move or speak or the fact that there was someone in my room threatening to kill my mother. My dad was killed by unknown people a few months back, and it had just been my mom and I since then. She took his death pretty hard. I had just turned 18 when it happened, and the shock was a lot for me to bear. Since then, I had started to stay up late, unable to sleep. After a while, whenever I finally fell asleep, I would wake up feeling groggy. But that was the first time I found it impossible to move or speak. The presence of that creepy figure in my room that I felt disappeared and I could feel my limbs. I shook them out before standing up from my bed. There was no one in the room. I went out and checked on my mom in her room. She was still asleep. I shook my head at myself. Nothing would happen to her. Perhaps I was just dreaming. The next night, my eyes flew open and tears sprang to my eyes. I couldn't move again. It was a terrifying experience that I would never wish on anyone. Run away, little Josie. Save your mom or I will sell her organs. It was that same spooky voice. This can't be real, I told myself. It didn't excuse the acute fear I felt, or the fact that I could almost feel the man's breaths fanning my neck. After the episodes repeated themselves for a whole week, I started to keep vigils, but I found that no matter what time I slept, I would still be paralyzed for a few minutes. I finally opened up to my mom and she looked aghast as she was listening to me. She apologized for being so wrapped up in her grief that she didn't notice me. Oh Josie, 
She wrapped me in a hug and tears fell down my face as I breathed in her familiar scent. I'm so sorry. We fixed an appointment with the therapist and I started to have sessions with him. He taught me relaxation methods and how to release stress and tension from my body. Although I must say that his methods were not very effective, I still had the same dreams. I like to call them dreams because it would make the whole terrifying scenario seem unreal. Or maybe it was real. The man in my room was just waiting for the right time. I had to do something before he did. One night, as I stood over my mother's unconscious body, I felt proud of myself. I had put in some sleeping tablets in her drink. Dad, can you see? I'm going to save mom. No one's going to take her away from us. I heaved with exertion as I dragged her out of the house. A cab was waiting for us downstairs, ready to take us to a safer place. If my mom woke up and tried to resist, I would simply explain to her that dad had been trying to get my attention. We had to protect her, by all means. I could not fail my dad. 